Welcome to Slate Church Online. We're so glad that you've joined us. We pray that wherever you're watching this from, that this message will bless you. If this message impacts you in any way, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. Awesome. You know, there's only one, you guys can grab a seat. There's only one person that can introduce me like that, I guess, except for maybe my mom and my dad. They could also introduce me that way. It's an extra special introduction this morning. How you doing? You recovered from all the turkey last weekend? You made it. You're here. Has anyone recommitted to the gym this week just to try to they're like, after Thanksgiving, that's my time. I think that we often commit to the gym after the holidays because we don't want to give up on the pumpkin pie and the, the delicious food. I know that's how I do it. I always commit to the gym after the holidays. But listen, I'm excited to be with you this morning. I'm excited to be here. Last week I was in Elmira, and I actually gave this message in Elmira, and I'm excited to bring it here to Waterloo because I think you guys might be a little bit more rowdy around here. We're working on the, the rowdiness in Elmira a little bit. I'm excited to talk about this message. I think it's an important one. I think it's one that if we can grab a hold of, it's going to change our day-to-day -day life, our everyday, not just years from now, not just things in the future, but how we actually live every single day. So listen, if you have your Bible, why don't you open it up to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And listen, I'm going to give you a little bit of context before I get into what we're reading so that you have a bit of an idea about what is going on right now in Scripture. You see, Acts comes right after the four Gospels, the four accounts, the four stories about Jesus's life. And basically what Acts talks about is the start of the early church, the start of what happens after Jesus has resurrected and the Holy Spirit has come on his followers, on the people. And in the first bit of Acts, we see that starting to develop. And when we hit chapter nine, we run into this guy named Saul. Saul. And you might have heard of him before. Basically in the early part of Acts chapter 9, we're going to start reading in verse 26, but before that, what we see happening is that Saul is persecuting followers of the way, this Jesus movement, these people who are following the teachings of Jesus, and he is persecuting them. He is putting them in jail. He is killing them. He is after them. He doesn't like them, and he is finding himself on a road to Damascus to continue doing that. He wants to continue persecuting Christians. But when he is on that road, he is met by Jesus himself. He has this experience, this experience that is almost indescribable with Jesus, this encounter that changes everything in his life in a moment. I think some of us in this place believe that things can't change for us in a moment or that other people we know can't change in a moment. But listen, Jesus can change everything in a moment. We've seen it. We see it in scripture. He can change everything. So he has this wild experience. He changes. He starts preaching this message of Jesus that he is the son of God. And later on, his name goes from Saul to Paul. And we find ourselves in Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And we're reading about Paul here. It says, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, rightfully so. He had just been killing their friends, killing other people like them, not believing he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them, and he moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, and they tried to kill him, just casually. They just tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. 
If you go a little bit further into the New Testament, into the book of Galatians, what you find at the start of that is Paul describing this period in his life in a little bit more detail, just a little bit more detail. And it actually talks about him going to Arabia for three years immediately after his encounter with Jesus. So he takes off and goes to Arabia for three years. After that, he returns to Damascus, but then he has to leave for safety reasons. He heads to Jerusalem, but then leaves again for safety reasons, which we see here. And then he goes to Tarsus. So the scholars believe that there were three years that he was in Arabia and then about 10 years of moving between these other areas. So between the time, in this time, we see 14 years go by. 14, 13 to 14 years is what scholars believe go by. And then we see Paul show up again in Acts chapter 11. In verse 25, it says this, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. You see, I think it's easy sometimes when we're reading scripture just to think that everything happens very, very quickly. I mean, we're in chapter 9, and then we're in chapter 11. A couple things happen with Peter in between there, and 14 years have gone by. A long time. Two chapters, five minutes of reading has gone by for us in reading scripture today, but 14 years have gone by. Sometimes we look at Paul and we just go, oh, he had this experience, he started preaching, he went on these journeys, he had this great time, he was thrown in jail, all of these things happened, and bam, churches were everywhere. Churches and things were happening constantly in Paul's life, but it wasn't the case. You see, there was a process that Paul actually took part in that took him to the destination and the purpose that God had for him. We saw this process of Paul growing into the person that God needed him to become in order to use him in the way that he wanted to use him. Why don't we pray this morning? Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Lord, I pray that you would take these words uh, that I believe you have given me, God, and that they would just be impactful in this place. In your name, amen. Amen. Does anyone in here like like to host people? Have people over to your house, your apartment. There's a few people. Some people are like, I don't like people. Listen, if you like to host people, throw your hand up. I want to see you out there. Okay. Now, how many of those people like to also cook for those people that are coming over? Provide a meal. Okay, we have a decent number of people. Some of you are like, I'm about the hosting, but I'm about the takeout. Pick up a pizza on your way over. That is my version of hosting. Some of us like to cook. Did anyone host for Thanksgiving? Were you the host? In this place, all right, we have some hosts in this place. I decided this year to host Thanksgiving dinner. And we had a a good number of people. We had a mix of people. It was mostly my family. Some of Victoria's cousins were over for Thanksgiving from Sweden. So it was a good time. But I realized that I have some difficulty hosting and cooking simultaneously. I was a little bit in over my head with Thanksgiving dinner. The, the problem probably started when I decided to basically double everything so that I would have leftovers for the next 52 weeks until we hit <laughs> Thanksgiving again. I was like, I've got casserole dishes of stuffing that didn't fit in the turkey. I've got, it was insane. I still have like a giant... Tupperware container of mashed potatoes that, let's be honest, they're not lasting anymore. We are a week out. They need to go. But I went a little bit over the top, and it actually was a little crazy in the house. I was a little flustered. I put on an apron to try to play the part and try to look like I had everything together, but when people came over, I was like, hi, come in, sit down, don't come in the kitchen. Bye. I'll see you at dinner. I I didn't host people at all. I didn't have conversation with them. I literally just ran around cooking a meal because there's a lot of work that goes into cooking a meal. And I was thinking about this idea that when you're actually cooking a meal, whether it's Thanksgiving dinner or really any meal when you're having people over, there's a process that takes place. Sometimes we get a little flustered by that process, but there's a process that takes place and we actually can't neglect the process. I easily could have said, well, you know what? I just wanna, I just wanna host these people. We'll eat at some point. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna take the turkey out of the fridge and just kind of set it on the table. Why, 
what, what's wrong with that? No one wants to eat a raw turkey. That is what is wrong with that. No one wants to eat something that hasn't been cooked, something that hasn't had the time put into it for the process to actually take place. So if you're taking notes this morning, you can entitle this message, Cook the Turkey. <laughs> Cook the Turkey. It's a tip for life, okay? Cook the Turkey. You know, I think it's all, we all realize how ridiculous it would be if we just didn't cook the turkey. If we just put a raw turkey out on the Thanksgiving dinner table and said, here it is. If we completely neglected the process. And yet I think for many of us in our lives, we actually try to do this all the time. We want to see the results without actually stepping into the process. We want to see the promotion without actually putting in the hard work. We want to take a new opportunity, forge ahead, with, without actually realizing the cost that it takes sometimes. So what does it look like to cook the turkey, or maybe better put, actually find purpose in the process? Most of our life is actually spent in the process. Cooking a turkey took me all day. I woke up first thing, and I cooked all day. But eating that took about 15 minutes. Most of our life, we are actually spending in the process. And I think we can actually look at Paul this morning to, get a greater, to gain a greater understanding of how we need to live by something that's actually not even recorded in Scripture. By 14 years of his life that actually we don't get much detail about. And we can actually learn from this time in his life. So how do we do this? How do we find purpose in the process? What are the things that we need to remember if we're going to find purpose in the process? The first thing is this. We must remember that people are part of the process. People are part of the process. It says in verse 26, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas, he took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul was on his journey. He had seen the Lord. The Lord had spoken to him. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. See, I think a lot of us actually try to do life alone. Maybe we're intimidated by the people around us. Maybe it's difficult for us to have conversations with people. Maybe we just want, we're afraid of rejection and what that would mean. But a lot of us just try to do life alone. Now, I don't mean that we go around never talking to anyone. For a few of us, that might be the case. Most of us have these shallow conversations all the time. How's the weather? What did you have for Thanksgiving? Oh, turkey, that's shocking. Um, <laughs> What did you do last night? What are you doing this weekend? How was work today? We just have these general, shallow conversations all the time. But we're really not doing life with any depth with the people around us. We just kind of try to do life alone. And I think this is because sharing our calling, sharing dreams in our lives, sharing convictions that we have actually leads us to a place of vulnerability. And we don't like to be vulnerable. That's a scary place to be in. But you see, if we're going to embrace the process, we actually need to embrace it with other people who can keep us motivated, who can spur us on, who can encourage us when we're having a difficult time, when we just kind of want to jump ship, when we don't want to stick to the process and the purpose that God has for us. This is why we talk about something called connect groups all the time at Slate Church. We talk about it almost weekly. You're going to hear about it. If this is your first time at Slate, you are going to hear about connect groups. And basically what they are, they're small groups that meet on a bi-weekly basis for just one hour. It is a low time commitment. But I always say that the return on that one hour investment is so much greater. Because you're building relationships with people who actually care about you and want to do life with you. You see, Connect Groups is not so much about just getting involved in the church somehow. It's not just about meeting up with people and eating some food. It's not just about taking another hour out of your schedule every other week. It's setting you up to be able to find purpose in the everyday process in life. It's, it's setting you up to be able to surround yourself with people who actually care about you, who actually want to know, are you going to be here on Sunday? Let's have a conversation. How did that job interview actually go? Going a little bit deeper in these conversations. 
So I encourage you, as I always do, join a connect group if you're not in one. If you are in one and it's not meshing, go somewhere else. No one's going to be offended. You're not going to hurt anyone's feelings. Just shut down the people pleasing in yourself and just go somewhere else, okay? Go to another connect group. Find one that works for you. It's important to find people in the process. You see, Paul established friendships amongst peers who had the same goal in mind, who were going in the same direction. And it wasn't easy for him at first. When he first went, he was rejected. They're like, you have not changed. I'm afraid of you. And he actually needed someone to vouch for him. Find the people who can vouch for you, the people who can walk alongside you, who can bring you in and be that person for someone else. Who can you come alongside? Who can you bring into the conversation? Who can you invite into the group? Who can you bring along to your connect group next week? Who can you think about that you can actually vouch for and say, hey, this person needs relationship in order for them to actually find the purpose that God has for them? And for some of us, this is like... This is a great idea. You're like, I love this. But I think sometimes we can take this idea of having deep relationships and kind of label it feminine. And for women in this room who don't fall into this like feminine category, that's difficult. For men in this room, that's also difficult. Sometimes in this kind of, we get together and we cry and we drink tea and we just bare our souls to one another. That's not really what I'm talking about. Maybe it is for you. Maybe that's your best way to communicate the goals and the plans that God has for you. It's just to curl up and, and talk close together. But maybe it's actually just to go out and, and go out to a restaurant and just have a real conversation. Maybe it's actually just to have someone over for dinner and have a real conversation as, as couples together. It doesn't have to be this over, overly emotionalized experience. If that's something that you're like, I am not into that, that's okay. That's not what this has to be. It's actually just sharing, this is what the things are that God has for me. These are the ways I'm trying to go about doing it. Do you want to just jump into life here? Can you just support me in this a little bit? The second thing that we need to remember if we are going to find purpose in the process is that we shouldn't overcomplicate the process. We don't need to overcomplicate the process. I think it's easy to look around and see the results around us of the, of the people around us. We can see the destinations pretty quickly. Someone posts a picture on social media and it feels like, hey, they got to that destination. They've reached this certain level of achievement. They are now in this place that maybe I want to be in at some point. But we actually don't get to see the journey that took them there. We don't get to see the process that took them there. So we just kind of fill in the blanks. They must have done this and had this and had this opportunity and got lucky here and then they made it there. And we overcomplicate the process for ourselves because we go, if I don't have it all mapped out, if I don't have it all figured out, if I don't know exactly which steps are going to take me there, I'm never going to get there. I'm never actually going to get there. We try to jump into results, we try to figure it all out, and it gets complicated. It gets complicated. I remember about six years ago, Brandon and I took a road trip. This was our first Christmas married, and we were driving down to Florida to visit his grandparents. His grandparents at the time, they were snowbirds, they had a trailer in a little space in Florida called Lakeland, Florida. And listen, if you are picturing Florida and you are picturing like the coast of Florida and beaches and like people walking around partying, that is not Lakeland, Florida, okay? Lakeland, Florida is full of older people who, who don't like snow, okay? They go to trailer parks and there is nothing wrong. I think this is a great idea. But the thing that was going for us in this particular trailer park in Lakeland, Florida was there was a pool, all right? And a pool at the end of December is like the beach, okay? It's like you're on the coast if you're in a pool. I was pumped for that pool. I was ready for water aerobics with the residents in that place. I was ready to be there day in and day out. It didn't matter if it was only 18 degrees. It was negative 18 degrees here in Canada. So I was pumped for this road trip. And Brandon and I had been on long road trips before. We knew the drill. We kind of got the idea that he would be doing 95% of the driving and I would be doing 95% of the sleeping. 
And that's how it worked for us at this particular time. But I was also navigating. I was also the person who got us there in many ways. So at this time, six years ago, it was very expensive to turn on your cell phone in another country, to have the data, the roaming charges. I didn't want $7,000 on my phone bill when I got back. So instead, I had this brilliant idea. I was like, I'm going to go on Google Maps and print out all of the directions and just navigate us that way. I'm like, people used to do that with maps. People used to get, honestly, I think that our IQ has dropped significantly in this age of technology. I still, I actually have a difficult time comprehending how people traveled before the internet. I, like, it's, it's one of those things, I'm like, I just, I can't quite understand it. You just must have been smarter. You just must have had an, a better understanding on life. But anyways, this was old school printed it out, had all the directions, and I was like, this is perfect. I have every single direction written down that we are going to need to get us from here to Lakeland, Florida. This, what could go wrong? This is the best thing. I, I know it all. I have full control. It's a good feeling to have full control. I know where we're going. We're getting to this destination. But how many of us know that often things come up along the way that we're not expecting? So every time we hit a detour, every time we hit a road closed sign, every time we missed an exit because I was sleeping, I, we had no way of figuring out how to get back. We just kind of had to go for it and, and turn around and we had to get back to our exact destination because the next step relied on where we were, not the wrong place that we had gotten to. And we had no idea where we were going and it was a bit of a mess. We made it. But it was a bit of a mess. And this idea of control, this idea of having every step mapped out and figured out that would get us straight to Lakeland, Florida, actually was a bit of a flop. Now, nowadays, 2018, when it only costs $5 a day to put your phone on in another country, I just put it into Google Maps. I'm like, Lakeland, Florida. I don't, I don't use my finger to text. I use my thumb. Um, <laughs> Lakeland, Florida. And the amazing thing there is it just gives me the next step. There's this lovely voice that comes out over the phone and it just tells me what to do next. And the difference here is that it's extremely agile. It knows the current conditions, the current situations, the current things that I'm going to be facing and just adjusts the route. I don't even know that the route is being adjusted. It just adjusts the route for me. It has the thousands and millions of possible ways to get down to Lakeland, Florida. It knows exactly where to go and takes me there one step at a time. And I think that this is actually the better way to live our lives. The destination is still the same, but I now have infinite options on how to get there. And I'm actually not even relying on my own ability to figure it out. You see, this is actually like trusting the Holy Spirit in the process. This is something that we actually have access to as Christians. We don't have to have it all figured out. You can just take that pressure off of yourself right now. At first, it might seem like a good idea to overcomplicate things, have every possible step figured out, every single part of the process sorted out. But it actually is going to lead you into directions that you're not aware of because things will come up and you won't know how to handle it. You won't be able to figure out the changes that you need to make. There's this term in psychology called locus of control. Maybe you've heard of it, locus of control. And psychologists would say that we have an internal or an external locus of control. There's two different kinds. People who have a high internal locus of control believe that they have a, an ability to make their own decisions, believe that they can actually step forward, that they can take control of their lives, that they can make decisions, that they determine what happens to them. People with a high external locus of control believe that things just happen to them, that they actually don't have much control. They often blame things on other people. They blame things on a situation. They actually don't have much say in it at all. But I believe as Christians, we actually have this third locus of control, and that's the Holy Spirit. We don't have to rely on our own ability to make decisions, our own ability to be smart enough. We don't have to blame it on all of our situations around us and just say, well, if this was different and this was different, then I would have gotten to my purpose and the place I ha that God had for me. We can actually rely on the Holy Spirit to take us in the next 
step, the next direction. Just follow the next step that God has for you. Paul didn't have a grand plan about his missionary journeys, starting churches, maybe getting locked up in jail along the way. He didn't have it all set in stone. He was simply following God every step of the way. We just need to be faithful in the next step and not overcomplicate things. The third thing that we need to remember is that personal revelation is found in the process. Stick with me here. Personal revelation is found in the process. You see, it's really easy to fall into complacency when we don't see big, dramatic, exciting moments time after time after time, when we don't feel like what we've been called to is actually coming to fruition. It's easy to grow complacent and stop moving ahead when we're not seeing those results that we're looking for. And this happens in our everyday life. It's easy when you're trying to lose weight and you get on the scale after a week of like eating nothing and exercising like crazy and nothing has come off of your body. You have not lost a single pound. It's easy to be like, and I'm going to the store to buy chips. Like it's, it's very easy. It's easy after you've been working your butt off at work and someone else gets that promotion to be like, all right, I'm coming in late tomorrow. You know, what's the point? What's the point? It's easy to grow frustrated in those situations. It's easy to grow frustrated in maybe areas that are a little bit more sensitive, a little bit more difficult, month after month after month trying to have a baby. And it's just not happening. It's easy to grow frustrated in those places. But we have to remember that it is important to stick with the process. And you see, I'm not just talking about a variety of destinations that maybe we have for ourselves in our lives, like losing weight or getting promotions. I'm talking about God-given dreams, the things that God has placed on our heart. Maybe you can sit here today and go, I remember, I know the things that God has placed on my, I know the things, and maybe it was years ago, maybe it was months ago, where you can be like, yeah, God really grabbed a hold of me here. This is not a me idea, this is a God idea. And it's easy sometimes to grow complacent in that, to grow frustrated when we're not actually seeing ourselves get to that place of purpose. See, I don't know about you, but I don't think I would have blamed Paul if after a couple of years, his enthusiasm had dropped a little bit. Because really, what the Bible's showing us is he he was kind of doing the same thing for year after year after year. He was preaching. He was just kind of living his life. It seemed like things things were good. There was peace. Things are fine. But Paul did not grow complacent. He did not grow weary. He was determined. He was radical in his teaching. He was persistent. And how did he do this? None of this was recorded in Scripture. None of this was something that was highlighted in his life. This wasn't things that people were necessarily talking about all around him. 14 years of this. 14 years. I believe that Paul was able to sustain this because he had a personal revelation from God that took him the course, that took him the distance. I think for some of us in this place, we actually need to get back to a place of prayer, a place of reading God's word, a place of actually paying attention in church, a place of being open to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us. You see, a personal revelation is very simply a deposit of truth that grabs a hold of us so tightly that we can't shake it. We wake up in the morning, we can't shake it. We go to bed in the evening, we can't shake it. We're talking about it with our friends. We're bringing it up in conversation because it is so deeply affecting us. And personal revelation comes from the Holy Spirit being welcomed into our lives. Because when you get that revelation of what God has for you, the purpose that he has for you, the plans that he has for you, the destiny that he has for you, when that personal revelation grabs a hold of you so tightly, you can't shake it. But we need to make sure that we continue to go back to God, continue to invite the Holy Spirit in, be walking with him daily in order to make sure that personal revelation is constantly strong. You see, we can't just muster up enough excitement in ourselves. We are only human. We can't just get up every morning and be like, okay, if I just do 10 jumping jacks and tell myself this great mantra, then I'm going to be good forever. Like, we need a personal revelation of what God has for us 
in order to sustain us in the long run. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap the harvest if we do not give up. Do not give up in this place. Seek that personal revelation from God in order to find purpose in the process. And the final one is this. Position yourself for change. Position yourself for change. Are you positioned for change in this place? Paul was doing the same type of thing for 14 years. For 14 years. But all of a sudden, everything changed. Everything in his life completely changed very quickly. In verse 25, chapter 11, verse 25, it says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught in great numbers of people. All of a sudden, Barnabas comes looking for him in Tarsus. And basically says to Paul, let's go. Are you ready? Let's go. Boom. Things start to happen very quickly after this for Paul. All of a sudden, within a couple of years, he's on his first missionary journey. He's set apart. He's starting churches. They're encouraging believers. He's stoned. He's in prison. It's, on, it's wild. Scripture is not boring. If you are under the assumption Scripture is not boring, you need to read your Bible again because it is wild what is actually happening to Paul here. And these things happen quickly. After 14 years, all of a sudden, things happen fast for Paul. But I was reading this and wondering what would have happened if after all that time, Paul had grown so comfortable in his current routine. He'd grown comfortable, and when he got up, what he ate for breakfast, where he went, who he talked to, who his neighbors were, who his friends were, he had gotten so comfortable, so attached to his normal. What would have happened? See, I think for many people in this room, maybe you once had dreams. Maybe you once had a purpose that you were walking towards in your life, a plan in your life, things that God was dropping into your soul. But they didn't really pan out in the timing that maybe you had thought. So you just kind of jumped into your normal. Life just got busy. Life just got full. Maybe you're in a place where you had a couple of kids. You kind of got into that life, that routine. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe life is just full of just your, your everyday routine. Maybe you're busy in university and you're just taking tests and constantly reading, going to class. Life just got busy just got full, and you just found yourself growing comfortable in that normal rhythm and pattern without a purpose or a destination that you were moving towards. And as I was preparing this message, I just felt like God was saying to me that sometimes he's coming and going, where is my church? Where are my people? Where are the people that I wanted to use in this moment in time? Have they grown so comfortable? Have they neglected the process? Have they stopped developing? Have they stopped moving forward? Have they stopped seeking me? Have they just gotten so comfortable in our 21st century everyday life, a consumeristic society? Have we just gotten so comfortable that if God said, hey, I need you to go, I need you to do this, we might just say, "Mm, I don't think so. I can't. I can't. I get together with my friends and watch this show on that night. Sorry, God, I actually can't give more time to the church because I just need more time for me. God, I I can't take that risk financially because I just need to be all about financial security. God doesn't ask us to be foolish in all the things that we do. But God asks us to take the next step. And are you ready to actually take the next step when he asks you to do this? Are you ready to change things up? And maybe it's not going to look the way it did for Paul. You know, it might not look like moving halfway across the world. It might not look like traveling everywhere. It might not look like preaching. It might, it might not look that way. It might, but it might not. But change might mean, hey, Start a connect group. Don't just join one, start one. Change might mean get involved. Change might be, hey, 
You've been praying for a church like this to come into this city for years. Why are you sitting back? Why have you been coming here for six months and you aren't involved? Change might be actually stepping out and saying, hey, I'm actually going to take a step into what you have called me to do, God. Listen, I can't prescribe that for you. But it's important that you ask yourself the question, if I, have felt, if I am open to you and I felt a nudge of the Holy Spirit to finally step into this area, into this purpose, into this dream, if all of a sudden this opportunity dropped into my lap, would I actually be ready to step into it? Would I actually be ready to jump into it? Have I actually taken care in the process to be ready for change? See, this morning, I think it's important that we remember not to abandon the process. That we need to find purpose in the process. Maybe you need to get yourself around some really great people. Maybe you need to stop overcomplicating the calling. Getting so caught up in the next step, the wrong step, the possible step, that you just don't do anything. We need to keep pushing forward in this place with deeper revelation from God. And we need to be ready for change. We can't underestimate the significance of growth that happens in the process, in the preparation. Good things take time. No one wants to eat a raw turkey. They just don't. And it might be 14 years it might not be. It might be a lot shorter than that. But are you ready to be faithful with what is in front of you? Are you willing to take the time to actually bear fruit? Would you stand in this place this morning? I'm actually going to call the band to come up a little bit early and the, the singers as well. Because I think this is a message that we actually need to take a moment to reflect on. Maybe in this place you're going, I don't even know... I didn't even know that maybe God could have purpose and calling and goals and dreams that he could deposit in my life. I didn't even know that the Holy Spirit wanted to work in my life. So before we go into this opportunity just to reflect a little bit, I just want to give you that opportunity just to make a commitment to follow Jesus. You know, we do this every single week here at Slate Church. We talk about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow God. And if you're in this place and you're like, I've never made that commitment before. I never even knew that there was a God who had plans and purpose for me. I never even knew there was a God that cared about me. It's a very simple thing. Jesus simply wants relationship with you. And all it is is saying, hey, I want that too. God, would you just accept me as I am? You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all figured out. He accepts you exactly as you are. But then he loves you too much to leave you that way. So this morning, just before we go into worship again and take some time just to reflect, I just want to give this opportunity. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus in this place and you want to do that today, you want to jump on board with the purpose that God has for you, I'm going to give you that chance to do that. Would you just close your eyes just for privacy? We don't want to manipulate anyone in this place. But if you just know, if you just kind of, kind of know that you need to make that choice, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to point you out. I just simply want to pray for you. So if that's you in this place, on the count of three, why don't you just raise up your hand? One, two, three. I see that hand, and I see that one there too. And I see that hand. Thank you, God. Anybody else in this place? Thank you, Lord. I just want to pray for you if you have your hand up right now. God, you see these hands, you see these hearts, Lord, that want to be dedicated to you, Lord. What an incredible decision to make. God, right in this moment, I pray that you would draw close to these individuals here, Lord. I pray that they would know that they are not alone. And no matter what difficulties they face, no matter what things are going on in their life, they would know that you are for them, that you are with them, that you go before them that you care for them, Lord, that they can have close relationship with you, that they can trust you and lean on you every day moving forward because you love them and care for them. We are so thankful that you have given us this opportunity for salvation in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's celebrate. It's amazing. Amazing.
listen, if you're in this place, we're going to go into a song of worship, and then I'm going to close with prayer after that. But if you're in this place, and you just feel like, man, I need to realize what that purpose is. I need to realign myself with the process. I need to actually get a revelation from God about what it means to actually live for Him, live towards the purpose that He has for me, to keep stepping into that. I need to stop overcomplicating it. I need to focus on the Holy Spirit and what He is doing in my life. And maybe you're in a place and you're going, I actually need to be ready for change. I need to be ready to take the opportunity to say yes to what God is asking me to do. So we're just going to sing this song, but listen, don't feel like you have to sing. Sometimes you just need to be quiet. You just need to think back, pray, reflect, and we're just going to take a moment to do that in this place. Thank you for watching. And again, if you were impacted by this message, we would love to hear from you. Send us an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. If you'd like to learn more, fill out one of our online connect cards on our website. We would love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. And remember, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.